So what um, I thought would be kind of fun today is to take a look at a phenomena that has been brewing in my uh, on our, our on our kitchen table for a little while and um, use it as just a little bit of practice of looking at a phenomena and asking questions and thinking about you know what what could we do to um, explore and document this on a nature journal and um, and also sort of see what kinds of questions come up when we get more people looking at it. Um, also, this is uh, an example of the just sort of teaching nature journaling on a um, on a zoom digital platform. All you need is something that kind of catches your eye and you think is kind of cool and then uh, you can use that to explore with a group of people. And the start of this, the start of this was some months ago, I did a program with a group of kids in the Philippines. And uh, so there was a, 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 a Zoom space filled with all these, these, these families. And I had a potato. I had a potato. I had a potato that had started to sprout in my pantry and I brought that out and we did the whole program just with this potato. And what I did is I, I started off with this potato and we looked at the potato and sort of figured out, you know, like what um, we, we did some, I noticed, I wonder it reminds me of, and then we started using words, pictures and numbers to, to document and describe it. And the uh so i'll introduce you to that potato um well, let's see if there it is and so i'm going to bounce over to the potato cam and good um let's make it possible actually for everybody to good yes people can unmute themselves so if any time during this potatoing process you want to contribute, um, you can just unmute yourself. Normally we have that all locked down and under special controls, but we're gonna try it today because um, I, I think there'll just be no Zoom bombers coming in and looking at the potato today. And if they did, they kind of like, oh, they're looking at a potato, let's go bother somebody else. And um, also Zoom bombers just tend not to like Zoom programs that involve tubers. Um, and so uh, let's, let's go to the potato cam now. I'd like to introduce you to my potato. Uh, this is the first look that I had at my potato. And there it is, there's, there's my potato. Um, and it was brown, but it had these two little things that were sticking out of it. And so the kids were coming, they came up with questions like, did it start with these curling up or did they were they curling down but unfortunately i had taken it out of the cabinet um, and i didn't record which way was up with these and we got to um we got to the uh, it reminds me of part of this and one of the kids said that it reminded them of a viking because it had these two horns on it and so this then became this this Viking helm, and thus it was named Thor the potato. And um, so yeah, this was back October twentieth. And then uh, you know always always put your date on, but then uh, something happened, and that was that a little while later, um, I made another entry about Thor the potato. And Thor, uh, and I didn't, I didn't put a date, no metadata, look at that. But Thor was turning green, and Thor was growing these other little kind of nuggins out of it. And that was, that was, that was fun, but definitely this, this Thor could use some metadata and some words and pictures and numbers. It really just kind of goes to show just how, when you just have a drawing of something in the middle of your page, how that is a that's a shallower experience than when you're kind of 
you're really kind of using your full nature journaling bag of tricks. For some reason, I just got distracted and this never went further. However, Thor the potato stuck around. And I would like to introduce you to Thor. Now, remember the last date we had on Thor was back in October. And check this out. Look at that. Oh, ooh, I mean, isn't that cool? I mean, Thor has gone full on Triffid here, right? This is, this is crazy. So this little bump went on and did something. It's interesting, this thing that was growing on the side seems to have fallen off. This one did something fun. This one did something really, really fun. And look at these little, look at these, look at these arms on this thing. I mean, that's, that's crazy. So what I wanted to do is, is, is just to, to document what is happening on this words, pictures, and numbers. I notice I wonder what it reminds me of and put some metadata in because there, if you look really carefully, some of these there's a strange little structure out here on the tips of these. And I think there's something else that's about to happen, but just hasn't yet. All right. So let's everybody get out a pad of paper and we're going to document Thor together. And we'll see what happens. So I'm going to interrupt our regularly scheduled program here just to kind of back up and sort of think about what I'm doing. What I'm trying to do is lay the groundwork of why I'm excited about this. And I'm authentically excited about Thor the Potato. And what I want to do is get all the participants to kind of like, oh, this is a neat potato. Because the more you're thinking like, this is a cool potato. What's up with this potato? The more fun you're going to have with it. And the um, and the, the, the more likely that you are going to, um, the, the, the more you're going to kind of lean into the potato. So in terms of setting the stage, I just tried to get, tried to, I got the students when in, in the Philippines, I got everybody really excited about this potato. And once we realized it was a Viking, everybody was all in on this potato. We had a great time. This was like, we spent like an hour looking at this but right so um so at the start i'm just trying to help people kind of hook into it so that's sort of metacognitively what i've been up to now back to the potato camp now at this point um want to check in with anybody does anybody have any thoughts comments and ideas about uh the potato um ideas to share maybe we could just start with some i notice i wonder it reminds me of avea what is this making you think um because I'm very fond of humor. The first thing I thought was of the of, of the comic, The Mighty Thor. And I'm like, Thor got mightier. And then because I watched the Marvel movies, I looked at the crazy new growths and thought he's wearing Hela's helmet. Hela from the Marvel movies has almost like a stag look to her helmet. And it's like, he's trying on his big sister's helmet. That's so cool. That is, I mean, that's good. I know See, that, that, that's, that's a fun, it reminds me of, right? That that makes us oh and 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 Marsh is saying it's a Medusa. Yeah. Look at that. Look at that. Um, so yeah, what 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 else can we 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 say about this? Remind uh, Kate saying reminds me of the stag antlers. Um, see, isn't the it reminds me of part of this fun? Like the minute that this becomes that this becomes you know Hella's helmet or it becomes a stag. Right, it this it, it's animating this little spud, and that's becoming ooh underwater coral with seaweed. Oh, look at that! Right, yeah. What else? What else? What else? What else? Where are you going? I wonder about the branching pattern. Is this going to be? Is there some sort of fractal thing to it? All right. Um, so any questions, observations? Noticing the skin is pretty soft. Look at this, my, my fingers kind of see how that we can we can squeeze it. Hmm. Right. I 
so I um, wonder if this is losing fluid. And I would have expected between now and October, like more to have actually happened with this. And I wonder what what stimulates growth of the little of the little nuggets. How long it will stay alive on its own internal starch? Yeah, this has been out of this has been not in contact with sunlight. I wonder what would happen if it got in contact with sunlight. Um, I was also wondering what would happen if it was in sunlight. And I noticed when um, you had it laying on the um, with the other cam view, um, it seemed like the the things coming out of Thor um, had a purplish cast to them. Yeah, they do. They do. Yeah. So like, is there, there's like what anthocyanin is one of the purpley pigments. Like is, is the green in here chlorophyll? What, what pigments are we, are we seeing? What is the function of those? Huh. Um, and you know, how large or tall will this with, with will this get? Interesting to sort of see how much it can do just on the storage inside this, because again, this has not had had any sunlight this whole time. Makes me feel a little bit guilty because I'm starting to kind of bond with this little spud. All right. Okay. Interesting. I ha I have something to say. Yeah. <laughs> Quickly, maybe. But um, I think I mentioned to Kate and um, Amy that I was out sketching and I drew a rock because it reminded me of a spud. So I thought about doing a whole education um, workshop that would be called potato landscapes or spud landscapes. And then there's what grows from rocks and the trees and you know the fungus and everything else. But if you have spuds at home, you can just practice drawing them like and make them into rocks eventually and then to a, a landscape. I haven't put it all together, but we can talk about it. <laughs> you know, when I was, um, I like that. When I was in um, a graduate student at University of Montana, I was a teaching assistant in a biology class. And one of the things that the professor had people do is um, take a rock and a potato and to document the changes in those once a week. And that was really fun, except my potato, instead of doing something like this, my potato just rotted and turned to this, this incredibly foul smelling thing that made my entire apartment smell like rotten potatoes. But I was still, I was going like, oh, got to keep with this project. So like, like I have got a, got a thing going, but for like months, my, my apartment just really, 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 that was a pungent potato, but um, but that yeah. kind of an, an interesting thing that to compare it with a rock. It's the an rock, alien. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's an alien too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, really, really alien. Shape. Oh, okay. So you see now we're starting to kind of get more curious about this, right? And that's that's making this. This, so the potato is getting to be a little bit more fun. So what I'm going to do on my piece of paper is we're going to go back to the potato thrill cam. And, um, you know, we've used, just sort of noticed how I wonder, I notice I wonder it reminds me of gets people, um, uh, and notice, I wonder, it reminds me of gets, gets people thinking about, um, hold on just a second. I'm going to, hey, Billy Joe, welcome to the, the party here. We are hanging out with, um, with a potato and um, we're going to be, um, we're going to be documenting what we see and, and sort of as a group, doing kind of a group I notice I wonder it reminds me of on it as everybody's sort of putting this potato into their journals we're looking at how you can kind of run a zoom nature journaling program with a little spud in your house and um and as long as you you know just some little hook phenomenon all right <clears throat> so let's 
Um, before I kind of zoom down on this more, I just want to show you something that I will often do when I'm kind of drawing something like this is I will often just put it on my little piece of paper and lightly trace it like that. So I've got little, you know, this, these little crowns are coming out to about here. This little thing is sort of coming out and branching. And then I've got some marks on my paper that are going to help me get a little bit closer. Oh dear, my camera doesn't like it when I change levels and positions. Let me turn this off and turn this on. Just a sec. Ah, there we are. So we're a little bit closer to this thing. All right. And um, so what, what I will often do is put, when I'm drawing something like this, I will put it on my page sort of see how I've kind of got this aligned here so that the back of this one is here the front of this one is here and then if I'm drawing it putting this in here life size then it's 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 going to help me be able just to kind of look up and kind of measure visually so I'm initially putting in just a few little marks that are going to help me get this thing be the right size and at this height in here that's where this structure is now it's more center here okay so that maybe is all i need to do with my little purple pencil and then I'm going to just grab a grab a pen and see what happens if I start to record information about this. As as you're looking at this, oh, uh, one other thing, I often will start drawing the parts that are closer to me. Since this little structure is on top, I might start with that, and just to. Um, because other things that will go in behind it are so I'm seeing this there's a sort of purple cone and the purple cone has these green filaments that stick out of it so I'm just sort of wondering structurally what those are by the way everybody you can still unmute yourselves so you're looking at this and starting to kind of document it on your piece of paper what are you wondering about? What are you asking? And this, these little purple cones are slightly fuzzy. Huh. It's an interesting texture. And then there's this little green thing. I wonder if this is going to be leaves or something that is sticking out on the end of it. What are you noticing or slightly fuzzy what are you wondering about as you are looking at this thing And um, oh, please, please say them out loud because I'm looking down and I can't check the chat. So if there are kind of cool ideas that are coming into the, the chat, I'm not going to be able to read and respond to those. I'm wondering if um, <clears throat> as the potato, if the potato were growing underground, would the leaves would it begin to make leaves underground or would it wait until it got to possibly the surface? Mm. Oh, see, that's, that's cool. So if these things are leaves, is there some sort of signal that you're like, oh, wait, so would it open leaves? without 
sunlight or underground. Ooh, that's interesting. So yeah, think think about that. Like what is what kind of strategy is this thing going to be using? And is that is it just kind of going on autopilot or is it really detecting and sensing and responding to the environment that it's in? I'm wondering these little green projections here on the these little kind of antler things. What what are what are those? These little these little cool things. So I'm wondering with the depth of a potato, like if it's kind of going off of um, Aveas, if this was underground, would these be already poking out of the ground, like to start the new plant or would they still be submerged? And then again, kind of uh, going on Aveas, like we see leaves now, but do we see the leaves now because it's above ground, but maybe those shoots would actually be longer before it gets above ground to sunlight. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I like about that, sort of line of thinking is that we're we're realizing that the artificial environment of sitting in my kitchen mm -hmm. is different than what you'd be experiencing if you're underground and also you would have um uh, so this is this weird green green sort of paddle um you know how how is this how is this different to what you would be experiencing if you were in soil and could get water? And so another thing that this thing doesn't get is any liquid. Yeah, that was my other question. It looks so wrinkly, right? So like how long has it been on your counter for and would it look this wrinkly underground or would it be more like, would it be more depleted at this point or it would be less depleted because of the extra nutrients that are in the ground? I don't know. Mm -hmm. that, that sort of really kind of makes you think about how the methods that we have to um, study something change what we're studying. There is this, you know, it, we find if, if we put you know, colored leg bands on birds to tell them apart. We may be creating secondary sexual characteristics that the, um, the, the that, you know, the, the, the birds who are lucky went in the, the study that I did in my, uh, when I went to graduate school, we had all these buntings, um, which are these wonderful little songbirds on a mountain, all color banded. And, you know, just by chance, the one who had the greatest uh, nesting success was the one with all red leg bands. You know, and this, the buntings are birds that have, you know, red in their plumage. Did we create these sort of strange secondary sexual characters that gave those birds then a, a, an advantage? You know, sometimes by by the way you look at something, the idea of the sort of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is by the nature of our behavior of observing, how are you affecting the behavior of the phenomenon? So how is this different than the thing that is on um How is this different from something that is underground? You think it'd be just so natural to just take your sketch and put dirt around it and say, this is what the developing potato looks like. But this is, yeah, the developing potato that is on my... There it is. So 
So I'm using a micron pen here, I'm trying to get used to using that, something that I, and this is a pretty th wide one. I'm kind of enjoying it because I can press lightly and get a light mark. I'm just discovering that. And so I can get some real line variation with this. This might be something that I want to experiment with more. The thing I'm wondering about is, maybe this is a weird question, but I like weird questions. Um, because this is coming from a tuber, instead of possibly from a seed, then do those, do, does Thor's Viking horns happen to have cotyledons or do they all immediately develop into being true leaves? Oh, that's interesting. Um, so will there be cotyledons, I'm writing that out on my paper off screen, will there be cotyledons um, or is that only in seeds? And then to build off something that Billy Joe said, um, does, does the nature of it being a tuber mean that it keeps well and survives really well if it's underneath the snow. Oh, t tell me, tell me more about that. Um, sometimes I wonder about like we see the seeds that come up in the springtime, and we know that if you're in a snowy place, then it's hard sometimes for certain things to come up. So, does having this lovely big starchy um, um, tuber? mean that it survives the winter because of that or does the winter just plain arrest its growth and freeze all of the growth how does it that it manages to survive the winter without simply rotting away and becoming mush Ooh. oh interesting yeah you think about just all you know being down there in the soil all the rot potential right and that, you know, how are you protected from not, from not rotting? Is it using any of its metabolic energy to kind of fight off rot? I'm going to draw a little side view of this thing. Oops, <clears throat> there's my little side view of this thing. And the, the, doesn't seem that there's more. It's also interesting to me that there's the, the major sprout things that have happened out here are all ones that we saw earlier. And back at the early stages of this little spud, they were kind of the proto, the, 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 the early versions of those. It hasn't been making more um, more little sort of sprouty arms. Hmm. That makes me wonder about growing conditions because, you know, you, it grows as part of that kind of the root area. And then I wonder what part it kind of broke off from the original plant. And then I guess, as it was growing, how it decided where the eyes were going to be, where those new sprouts were going to come out. Never thought about that. And then I also was wondering, you were talking about rot, but I wonder what sort of helpful fungi would be in the soil 
that might collaborate as opposed to turn it into rot. Just having learned that there are certain networks and systems that help supply nutrients between plants. So I wonder if that holds true for tubers or if that doesn't work so well because <laughs> they're underground and I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So we're thinking about how do the growing conditions around it affect where you're going to be sprouting out what's going on around here. Um, we also have um, how does the soil fungi change the story are that are they attacking and nom 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 or are they helping it collect water collect nutrients like a sort of a beneficial relationship. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I think before I forget to do it, I better write in that um, this is January 25th. Here it is. There's January 25th. And this one, unknown date. Arr. So um, let's just sort of pause for a second. Um, I'm going to jump back to the Jack Cam and so, um, Kate, was that you who was most recently, um, uh, giving some thoughts about the questions that you were asking? Yeah, that was me. Okay. Um, so what did I do while Kate was saying those thoughts? Anybody notice? Yep. Okay, it's going like this. So let's just kind of bounce back there for a second. Um, I found that, so as Kate was talking, I wrote the questions that she was writing down in my journal. Um, I also found that when I was working with the kids in the, the, the Philippine group, if they would say something and that would be reflected in what was what I was putting on my page, um, a lot more kids started saying things. And that I thought was 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 interesting that one way which we can it sort of reminded me of you know back when we we did the um what was that the that that art program um um there was why am i uh why am i blanking on its name um, is it visual thinking yes strategy? yes there you go thank you Avea. When we did visual thinking strategies, how one of the things that the visual thinking strategies people did is if somebody was saying something about a painting, the person as the facilitator would point to that structure. And um, as they were speaking in that way, the person kind of knows that they're heard. There's sort of a visual um, validation of the, the, the thing that's being said or, 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 or discussed. And that um, that that was a useful strategy in um, in getting the kids to participate. So I, I noticed that with 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 the kids that I was working with, um, if the when I started putting things down on the page, on my page that people had mentioned, um, that a lot more observations came out. And so that's, I think, something that we can we can do in this. Um, also, sort of, it's stressing the idea that the ideas that I get on my page aren't just from me. I can take um, I can take your ideas and and put those in. And that's not that's not cheating or anything. That's just like, oh, that's an interesting thought. That's an interesting idea that I didn't have. I want to. I want to. I want to. I want to have a record of that thought or that idea. And I just sort of it makes sense to me 
why those kids seem to offer a lot more suggestions when I started doing that. So I think that that's something that that's a strategy that we can use if we're doing kind of a guided study like this. Does anybody want a different angle or a close up of some part of it that you would like to see? What are other questions? Uh, well, let's, let's, let's sort of check this out. We have our, our, our strategies are words, pictures, and numbers. And then there's I notice, I wonder, and it reminds me of. And I want to make sure that, uh, you know, my, my brain's going to work a little bit differently when I am intentionally bringing in those, those different strategies. So maybe let's take a look at this from the point of view of words, pictures, and numbers. And just pause for a moment and see if what I've got down on my page, how, if I'm deliberately using those, what am I, let me move, move this up a little bit, what am I missing here? You could perhaps measure one of the um, one of the horns. Okay. You so you're saying that there's 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 no you're not seeing um, any evidence of of counting or numbers on here, and a way of getting that in would be maybe to measure part of this. Let's let's do that. So I'm going to bring in the goniometer because it's got a ruler on it. And I think that these little spikes are interesting. This one here. Yeah. I had a question about the little spikes. So I feel like I'm seeing some structures that pretty clearly want to be leaves, is my hypothesis, at the end of the different stalks. Um, but then we have a lot of those green bits, like that one, and yeah. those don't look leaf like at all. They look to me more like roots. So what are they? What purpose do they serve? Yeah, like what are these? So yeah, these little these little side horns. There's a bunch of them. Yeah. And what did, what do they remind us of? There could be roots. I'm trying to think of anything more than roots, but um, oh, and I had an I had an observation based on having grown potatoes that this is potentially multiple potato plants if it gets cut apart and each of those dudes get started separately. So you would I, cut this with one chunk here, here, this one, and this one. Yeah. So uh, explain to us how, how you kind of take something like this and turn it into multiple potato plants. So um, we've done this a few times at home over the pandemic. I don't, sorry, I don't have proper potato gardening advice, but rather sort of ad hoc, we were experimenting um, advice. Um, we noticed some potatoes sprouting and decided to try to plant them. Um, with those, we cut them up into sections that had one or two eyes. Um, that's the, the term for when they're not quite as um, developed as this, mm -hmm. but where you can start to see that there's some activity going on on the surface. And uh, maybe like an inch or so chunk around it. Um, and then you're supposed to let those dry out um, somewhat. My understanding hmm. is that if you plant them directly into soil and water them, there's a risk that that material will rot, but that if you let them dry out a bit first and then plant them, that is advantageous. Um, so you're going to you're going to cut these into chunks where each chunk might have have some little sproutlets on it. Exactly.
So we didn't take good notes, so I can't tell you um, which ones worked out better. Uh, of our supermarket plant, uh, potato planting. Um, we told somebody who knows more about potato planting and they became horrified and said, oh, no, 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 never, never do those. You should buy your potato starts. Um, N never do what? They, 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 were, they, were, they were terrified that you, you used potatoes from the store to do this? Well, I think their horror was more at wasted effort and not that there, anything bad would happen. Um, you know, from eating the future potatoes. Um, mm -hmm. hmm. I wonder if each of those, um, like the girthier spikes that are coming off are like future storage roots. So, one day would become potatoes and then the green parts that are coming off are the actual plant growing out of it and then maybe mm. it wouldn't really grow roots until oh. it had some something uh. above ground photosynthesizing maybe i've actually never grown potatoes so, so you're wondering if are these things that are growing out of it like the future these are potatoes of the future yeah that's that's what i'm wondering future tubers future tubers. Yeah, I, I also wonder too, uh, whether those little tubers that are coming off the side are ready to go uh, whichever way that they can, because it looks like they have roots and leaves on them. So they're like ready, they're ready, maybe. <laughs> A thing that I can um, say that I've seen before is when I grow potatoes, the plant goes grows all the way up and makes its huge leaves. And then when it begins to die, that's when I like, and when it was almost completely dead, that's when I begin to dig up the others. And what you'll sometimes find is by digging up the mother plant, you'll be looking at the at the little like at the long strandy white roots as usual. But then that's where the new potatoes are growing from. Some will get bigger and others will be like little tiny underground apples if that gives an idea of what it can look like. It's really cool. So, so you're saying that this, there, you'd have all these little white roots underground. There would be some places where there would be little swellings like this. Am, am oh, I understanding? Um, sorry, I meant to say that it's almost like you're seeing baby potatoes when the potatoes fully mature. <laughs> if, if that just helps to give anybody an idea of how the potatoes form. Hmm. Background information. That, that is really cool. I've also found um, that if you don't dig up all of the potato, that you'll get it back the next year. So from the root part of it, that starchy part, you'll it will start growing new plants. So we ended up with plants in our grass because we took some of the dirt and just dumped it to fill in a hole. And we ended up having a potato growing in our lawn. Oh, that's <laughs> fun. <laughs> Wow. Okay. That was a strategy. <laughs> Isn't there something with potatoes as well? Because you you put them so deep, and then I think in order to get more potatoes, I think that and it, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not like a super potato grower, but I feel like you then continue to add soil, like you mound the soil, and then I think like every new mound, it like encourages it to grow more shoots so that you get more potatoes. So those little purple green things that we're seeing could be a combination of like roots and shoots. And then when they get to a certain height, you like bury them again, and then you get like more offshoots. They want to just continue to sort of reach because the potato is the root, is it not? I think the potato is the root. So those would be the shoots that are coming. I think that's how it works, but I'm not. I only tried to grow potatoes once and I don't remember. Yeah, and what's what's the difference with what, what uh, Vail, what technically is a tuber? Um, so I could be wrong about this. In fact, I probably am wrong about this. My understanding is that it's kind of this, this starchy growth from a root, but itself, it's not the root. Um, the tuber, like, for example, you notice how the tuber can become, like, can become green and sort of photosynthesize. Um, so it almost acts as a bit of modified somewhere between root and stem. Mm. 
but I feel like I'm not identifying it very well. And that's something that now I want to look up and make sure I understand. Yeah, um, I, yeah I don't know if they call them tubers or, or they just call them seed potatoes. I don't know if they're like, because when you buy potatoes to plant in your garden, they literally look exactly like what is on like Jack's camera right now, right? So I don't know if those are just like old potatoes that have started to shoot out their eyes or if they are like a certain part. I don't know. Do you know? Um, actually, oh I have some growing outside right now. If I have a moment, would it be okay if I just go bring some in? Yeah. Go grab yourself a potato. <laughs> yes. I'll be right back. I'll bring go in some forth of into the potato land. Because and, and I'm I'm remembering that that like the tuber was like there's the, the, the roots were different than tubers. And like that well, the tuber was like a thickened stem. So I, I at first I thought that they were like that this is I remember kind of somebody being like really like like a potato is not the root and that this was a, a big thing. Um so, so that reminds me, I'm going to write in here to look up. Uh, I'm going to write, um, what is the death definition of a tuber? It's something that I feel like it's one of these things that I should know. I probably, you know, in Mrs. Samuel's class years ago, got exposed to, but, um, Ooh. The, uh, uh, oh, Avea has is bringing it in the, the the big book dictionary of oh yeah there we go. I don't know what happened to my illustrated botanists thing, so I'll just look up this really fast before I go get my potatoes. Okay, so tuber. Tuber. You know this Bring tuber. tuber. Um, tuber. It says, a tuber, tuber is or not tuber. That is the question. <laughs> um, and I like your question too, Linda, about bulbs. So tuber, a swollen root or underground stem. So right there, it gives you both root and stem. A swollen oh. root or underground stem that stores nutrients. Stem so tubers. Hmm? So it could be either. Mm -hmm. oh, it says, okay. And it says here, stem tubers, um, example given of potatoes, um, often produce buds from which aerial stems arise the following season. That's a complicated sentence. Now I'm wondering, aerial stems. Arise so place. stem tubers make buds mm. that, like, so could these be, these little arms be the buds then with the little green nuggets at the end, so the, the new leaves? Maybe. Ah. Mm -hmm. huh, huh, huh. So, this is fun. Let's 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 get that potato out. I'll be right back. <laughs> All right. So, um, Avea's running out to get a potato. So, what I what I want to, um, oh, uh, Kate Ryder saying it's always wild uh, that the further we dig into a topic, the less mm -hmm. we realize we really know about something very common and familiar. I, I think that's a huge huge point. Um, Kate, could I get you a uh, bring you on live to kind of uh, philosophize about that for a second, because I think that's a that's a critical point here. Um, bring you on here, add you into the spotlight. Kaboom, there you are. So yeah, tell, tell me your thoughts about that. Um, I, I mean, it was the same thing. I did a um, Zoom lesson on uh, moss and lichen. And the more I zoomed in and the more the questions the kids asked, the less I realized that I actually knew about anything. Oh, I don't know. Wait, is that really that? Oh, is this this? Oh, I I, I know this has to do with this, but what's really going on here? And um, yeah, I think it's kind of, it's very humbling, but also very exciting. And it's, I think trying to navigate that as a teacher is an interesting feeling because I felt like, I initially felt kind of this wave of embarrassment because I, you know, it had the little spikes picking up out of the moss that it was getting all reproductive. And I was sitting there going, I don't actually know what these are called. Are they, are they this, or are they that? And then I'm pretty sure this is what they're doing. Is there a male and female one? And, you know, and I'm asking all these questions and the students are asking questions and I don't really have any answers. And um, afterwards, Amy was so nice to say, you know, oh, well, you know, it's nice to model that. It's nice to model not having all the answers. And I think 
a lot of science teachers are kind of afraid of that moment of, of you asking the question behind yeah. the question, you know, of you just say, okay, this is a tuber, right? You just give the definition. It's a tuber. This is a, you know, potato, whatever it grows green. And then students are like, but where is it really growing from? And does it really need this? And how does this work? You know, I, I imagine that a lot of, you know, I think back to my time, you know, I would start asking those questions in science class and the teacher would just be like, you're distracting. <laughs> Why don't you understand? You know, well, and they I think, like it as long as you're asking questions that they know the answer to. Yes. Yeah. Right. But the minute you kind of step outside of that, it's like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's uncomfortable. It's kind of an uncomfortable space to, to be in that space of not knowing. Um, but it's also an exciting place because then you realize there's way more to learn. So. Right. So here we're putting ourselves in the place of not the teacher. The tuber is the teacher. And you're kind of an inquiry buddy. Oh, oh, let's let's check out what what is Avea brought in. So I have um, a couple of different forms. This is one that hasn't developed the seeds yet. Um, oh, you, what you dug him up. Hmm? Oh. You went out and dug up your dude. Oh yeah, that's fine. I mean. I'll just plant it again when, when this is all done. So we've got the remnants of the potato that it came from right here. It's hard to see. That right there is kind of this, almost like a potato husk. And then you can see all of the roots here. And then you can see in this root right here, a little potato forming. You see it? Oh, that little. Oh, wow. A little white that node. Little ball, yes. And so that's that's one that's a bit less developed. This one's going to be tricky because I don't want to destroy the, the what it's going on. But look, oh. so you see, it has a bunch of little potatoes that are forming oh, through the root. Look at these little guys! Aren't they cute? Look at these guys! Just oh, like no. underground, like apples. <laughs> They're so cute. Yes. Yeah. And so what I'll do is this this will continue to grow, and I'll wait until this is finished being green and then begins to die. And then what I'll do is I'll begin to dig and the ones that are big I'll keep and the ones that are little like this one I'll leave in the ground and that will ensure that I never run out of potatoes. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> that is really, really fun. And uh, so it's looking as though our potato friend, you see this big one here in the end? It seems as though this is the is is what our friend sprouted from right here. Mm -hmm. So that 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 was the primordial potato, the the yep. the first the the first tuber, and then all of these are subsidiary sort of tubers, kind of. Oh man. I'm here, okay. Oh, this yep. is this is cool. This is really cool. And so uh, I have a question from um, building from the definition of tuber. So, it stores nutrients. Um, how does that benefit the plant? I know that we want them because they're storing all that good starch and we want to eat them. How do the storage tubers, or do they, how do they benefit the, the plant over time? I'm wondering that too. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, there's, there's a lot of questions I would have about that. I wonder if it, the storing the nutrients is for times when nutrients are more scarce. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if maybe the climate is a bit harsher since from what I was taught, potatoes began in the Andes of Peru, that that's where they're originally from. So mm. mountain. Pretty cold. Um, yep, the cold. Maybe it was to help them through the winter, or maybe it was simply a survival strategy because I'm betting that there are seeds, like actual seeds from the flowers out there. But we mm -hmm. almost always hear about reproducing the potatoes through their tubers and not their seeds. Why is that? I have to ask. So if that's the primary way of actually reproducing, similar to the way that strawberries can, I mean, I'm sure it's more common to do the strawberries from seeds, the way that strawberries can reproduce through seeds or they can set out stolons, mm -hmm. little, little babies coming off of that one. So that's a secondary way that they keep on going. And so I have to wonder about that. Um, cool. See, so I love this. Yeah, that, that what a wonderful thought. Like, if 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 you're kind of growing up and then you're wilting, then what are you doing? That is that a form of vegetative reproduction? Then you know you're just going to leave. Like you're going to, I may wither and die, but I'm going to leave 
a dozen clones of myself. So are those little potato, those little tubers underground, sort of a self cloning mechanism? I wonder that too. Hmm. Oh, okay. This is this is fun. So so you see what's what's happened here? We brought in a phenomenon, and we got ourselves kind of curious about it. We, um, as we're going, we're demonstrating. Okay, I need to to, to words, pictures, and numbers. I'm going to do. Um, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, I'm going to get those things out of my head and onto a little piece of paper. And then by the time we're, we're done doing that, uh, this little <laughs> wilty potato friend is absolutely fascinating. Um, can, and, and, and actually, just to, to add to it, um, while, while you guys continue this discussion, I'm going to run into the next room because um, Thor had a friend. And I'd love to show you what Thor's friend did or didn't do. Um, meanwhile, continue the discussion um, because uh, y'all are rocking. Um. <clears throat> did did y'all want me to read the definition of bulb? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So bulb. It says that a bulb is an underground storage organ growing from a short, flat stem with roots beneath and comprising fleshy leaves or leaf bases protected by a surrounding cover of scale leaves. It allows the plant to survive from one season to the next and may divide by allowing vegetative reproduction. So it looks as though the bulb is similar in that regard, except that instead of the entire thing, it's like much more flattened about that and more about scale. Is, is the bulb technically part of the root? Mm, the roots are underneath here. So it, it's, it's also part of the stem. Yeah, it's the stem. So the bulb is the bulb. So the tuber can be stem or root. The bulb is part of stem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want to see <clears throat> Thor's little friend? Yes, please. No spikes. Huh. It's all little clumps. Are they the same kind of potato? They came from the same bag. Sure. And I don't know. So, ain't this world curious? And I, I love what, um, who, who was it who was making the comment about, uh, I think, Kate, you were saying about how, you know, you, you were, um, I'm bringing you back into the spotlight here, sorry. Whip. I should have warned you, but <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, you were talking about how you kind of get down there and the lichen, and then you realize, like, okay, I'm now past the point where I've got, you know, answers or labels for things. And then there's just stuff going on, and we're making observations, and we're all trying to figure stuff out. And that is, that is the space that I think is the most exciting for me as a teacher. And I think it's also authentically most exciting for the kids. When, you know, it's where it's it's not like there are everything is figured out. And and what we're doing is just um you're 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 giving them the terms and having them memorize stuff. You're you have kind of you have found a mystery and you are throwing yourself into it with them. Um, so that happened here today with our little, uh, so uh, okay, do, do you have any other thoughts that I think you kind of, I, I don't know if you got cut off a little bit, um, other thoughts about that experience or how was that for you and how did you handle it? Um, you know, just writing down all of the questions and just encouraging. Yeah, just exactly like saying like, oh, this is the good stuff. And now we get to ask all these questions and now we get to to look all this up and we get to to wonder about all of it. Um, 
actually, I realized I didn't write down any of the questions on my things. Oh, um, and then I one of the other ways that I handled it was just um, using the it reminds me of prompt that really helped um, like or it, it looks like, you know, um, because then it was just kind of a way to to just like observe and, and note um, what it was that we were seeing instead of going straight to labeling. Um, yeah, and just kind of allowing the, the question to just kind of exist and float around in our minds um, was kind of was kind of nice. And you know, I hope <laughs> I hope the students will go will go away and go. Hmm. You know, maybe next time I'm looking at it, you know, looking at moss and like, and I'm going to ask those questions and I'm going to look a little bit closer um, as well. Yeah, um, but I think it's it's hard because there is that sort of um, historical feeling that, you know, it's hard as a teacher. And I think I'm just so appreciative of this group that that emotional part, because we keep coming back to, you know, oh, the, the, the nature is a teacher, you're not the teacher and it's okay to not know everything. And, you know, you can always go back and read a book, like anybody can do that. But in this moment of exploring and exciting, you know, that's my job as a teacher. And, um, and I think, that is so has been so healing for me because I'm somebody who really struggles with words and names and labels. And so I always really wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to be a marine biologist when I was a kid, but I would just like do terribly in science classes because I couldn't remember the terms for things. I couldn't remember how to spell it. I would get it mixed up. I would only read part of a sentence and then I would get it mixed up. I would read my instructions out of order. And so trying to do a science experiment, it would always end up wrong. <laughs> I was the one in the corner going, why is mine brown and everybody else's is pink, you know? And, and so it's like, oh, well, I can't be a scientist. And, you, you know, this is kind of, it's, well, it's about the way of thinking and it's a way of approaching the world. And it's this curiosity and it's, it's interest. Um, but it's hard because it still kind of spikes in me when something like that comes up and I go, oh, I don't know the word for this. <laughs> And because I'm imagining, you know, those old science teachers or people, you know, looking at me and going, you know, you shouldn't be teaching unless you know all of these sort of terms. And so, you know, really being able to label myself and saying, you know, well, I'm not a science teacher. You know, I'm a nature journaling teacher. I'm this environmental educator. I'm inspiring wonder and curiosity. And I'm starting to connect with people now in the community who are saying, yes, we need more of that. We need more of the, the you know, just processing and understanding and note taking and exploring more than we need just you know a worksheet with labels and everything given to you. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been a process. Yeah. And so, so I'm, I'm just really grateful for for these sort of things where it's just you, you're you're demonstrating you know I you know every people look up to you you know Jack as as this expert. And yet you were like, oh, I don't know, what is a tuber? And it seems like such a basic question. You're like, I don't have that definition off the top of my head. And to just to demonstrate, oh, we can look it up in a book. We can ask somebody. We can just put down the question and let it stand is, is as I said, it's just kind of healing. And it's just kind of gives me these other options to explore. Um, and it gives me more confidence of going out there in the community and demonstrating um, this kind of like excitement and interest and curiosity instead of just, I am an expert and I know things and I'm going to tell you what to do. Yeah, the, I always love the kind of the idea of the, the guy on the side versus the sage on the stage. Sometimes our teaching can be a way of showing off. I, look, I've, I mean, and that's when I started in environmental education, that was the state of the art of the business. That what you do is you memorize a whole bunch of things about redwood trees and then bring people through the redwood forest and try to repeat back the stuff that you know about redwood trees as accurately as you can in a way that will engage them and keep them entertained. And people would come away from that and go like, wow, he sure knew a lot about redwood trees. But not be changed themselves. They're not having the insights. They're not, they're not in it. Um, so I, I actually specifically wanted to ask you about that, and you've already kind of answered it. That so when I said like, wow, like what technically is a tuber? I don't really remember, and I wrote it down in my journal here with a little checkoff box to find out what is a tuber. That didn't make you feel like oh, this guy doesn't know what a tuber is. Forget about him. 
Well, I mean, there's some people out there who are going to be like that, you know, and we just have to accept there aren't, and not everybody is, you know, going to approach things with kindness, but you know, you you want, I wonder with those people, if they are going to see that demonstrated and some part of them, some childhood part of them is going to go, oh, wow, look at that person. They just got up there and they didn't know the answer and nothing bad happened to them. You know, like you didn't get slapped with a ruler, (laughs) you know, you didn't, we didn't all leave, you know, like it's kind of amazing to go, oh, wait, maybe it's okay. Maybe there's this other way of existing and being, and that's going to be all right. And I'm not going to immediately get punished or insulted or, you know, get a bad grade. It's, it's about, you know. There is either a poem or a short essay in what you just said. That's a really powerful thought. Um, what I'd love to do is bring Rosa in on this. And oh. I'd also like to bring in uh, then Billy Joe and Avea, who were kind of doing some dueling banjos thoughts on this idea of um, when you don't know something. Um, add you into the spotlight. Okay, is it alright if we keep you here on screen? Okay, so Rosa, what does this uh, percolate in your brain? Um, there's a few things. Um, one is about scientists and not knowing, and how the general public feels about that. Um, one of the uh, really horrible things that has happened, I think, over the last three years is a politicizing of who knows what and um, an undermining of scientists and medical professionals by saying, well, they don't even know when that process of not knowing is how we come to know, right? It's by asking the questions that we don't have answers for that we learn more, Um, you know, as, as opposed to the expert who gets up and tells us every little thing about a redwood tree. Um, The other thing I wanted to bring in though is Richard Feynman, who many of you might recognize the name, literally a rocket scientist um, in the 20th century, um, part of the Manhattan Project. And in one of his memoirs, um, he really gets into the not knowing uh, and talks about auditing I believe a comparative anatomy class because he wanted to do something that was very different from his other coursework. And he was still taking the tests and stuff. And he was super offended because the kind of testing they were doing was like, just do you know all of these names for all of these bones? Uh, you know, each little tiny structure in the cat, for instance. And his indignation was about wasting his mental energy on that because he could look it up. He felt that there was not ever a time that he was going to be doing something with that, that he couldn't just look it up. And that this was, we would now say gatekeeping um, about who gets to participate in which knowledge activities. Um, And one of the things, as we're all saying, that is super valuable about this community and as we bring that further out into our larger communities is modeling the not knowing and the question asking is where the good stuff happens. Um, I could start talking about chat GBT, but I'm gonna not. Uh, what do other people have to say about this? Oh, this is, this is fun. Um, Rosa- Actually, I'm, I, I, I'm, indulge me, I'm gonna say one thing about the AI stuff. Um, a huge locus of protest about the idea of the new AI models for creating text is that this undermines teaching and how will we ever know if the students are actually learning or if they're just plugging things into the, the AI model and getting answers and producing those. And the best answer that I have seen so far to that is, well, then we need to teach differently. If our teaching can be broken down to just, I am teaching you rote material that you can just rotely bring back, um, why can't we use that as 
an exciting starting place that everybody has access to all of that knowledge. How do we go from there um, in building new ways of inquiry? Um, so a moment of excitement, not a, I think a moment of disaster. Could you yeah. So yeah, so if you're threatened by the AI, let's up our game and rise above what we can do just with parroting back memorized facts. Yeah. It's sort of kind of like a reverse Turing test. I like that a lot. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, would, would you mind sticking around a little bit? Um, of course. Because what you said is sparking with Billy Joe and Avea. Uh, I would love to bring both of them in on this. I'm going to see what's going on in the chat. Uh, and, and there we are. Um, so um, so I, I think the first comment that I saw was a, a Billy Joe comment, and then I saw uh, 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 a way of riffing off of other really interesting ideas. Um, Billy Joe, you were talking about, you had an interesting comment about uh, using your not knowing as a tool. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of stuff that I don't know. And so it's too much pressure to put on myself to try and know all that stuff, right? Like, especially with the full gamut of things that we teach, like there's no way that I could be an expert in, in one thing. That's just not what my education was. It wasn't focused in on one thing. It was a really generalist um, topic. And so for me, like, I totally get where Kate's coming from, where you're like, ah, but for me, I'm just like, eh, that's just who I am. So I'm just like, mm, I don't know. And so that's what I say to them is, I don't know, what do you think? And then they're like, well, I don't know either. And I'm like, cool, let's figure it out, right? Like, let's see what we can kind of come up with. And I think by me sort of humanizing the fact that even though I'm in that sort of like teacher role, that I'm not um, an expert, I have personally found that I find kids are coming up to me and asking more profound questions. Um, to like have a conversation with me. So I'm just going to give like a, a super quick one because this just happened on Friday and it was really cool. So I was in a school with um, grade five students <clears throat> and we were getting them to nature journal a food item out of their lunch. And then they were going to do a research project on that lunch item to find out what country it came from and uh, like its travels, packaging, all that stuff. Cause it was a, a whole lesson on uh, conservation of energy. So I was getting them to look into the energy that is used to get one piece of food from wherever it was in the world to them. And we started out by just nature journaling the package and where it was from and all this kind of stuff. And so near the end, a kid came up to me and he said, I had a question for you. And I was like, let's have it, let's do this. And so he said, I wonder, he goes, when we kill animals for food, it's or like we can kill animals for food and um and that's not murder, but when we kill people, it is murder, but you're still killing two different things. Like you're still killing. And I was like, that's a really great question. He goes, so what's the difference? And I go, that's a great question. So I was able to say like my thought process through that, I said, is that hunting has been around forever indigenous people were hunting so I said we're taking those animals as a type of food and I didn't get into cannibalism but I said when we kill people I said that's usually done out of violence or malice or something like that and so I said by putting those different contexts onto it that's what kind of makes me think of that and he was like yeah but it's interesting right I go totally valid it is interesting we don't look at those two living beings in the same sense. And so here we are, he's in grade five and we're having this like, you know, really big conversation about, you know, the, like the, the thought of life, right. And, and what that means. And so, you know, and I just think being able to have like being somebody who's open to saying, I don't know, let's nerd out about it. You know, I think can open up kids to being like, I think I can ask her this and she's not going to judge me on my question. Right. And so I always go, that's a great question. What do you think? And then they always look at me and I'm like, no, seriously, like I'm really asking you because I say, I don't know the answer. And they're like, you don't know the answer. I go, no, I don't know the answer. And they're like, oh, and I go, yeah, let's just nerd it out. Let's see if we can figure out. And so giving them that, that permission that 
I'm not looking for them to answer a rubric. I am just looking for them to use their minds is really liberating, I think, for them. Um, and it sets a tone in the class with the students that like, oh, okay, Billy Joe really just wants me to think. He really just wants me to use my brain. And then I say, okay, let's back it up. What can we find evidence-wise to back up what we're saying? And then I really encourage, my favorite part is the offshoot questions, right? So they might ask a simple question, but then I'm going to push them to mind map the crap out of that question. Like, where can you branch it off into all these different parts? Because again, that to me is really when it starts to get them to open and you start to get that flow coming out of them. And they're not just giving you those like, simple stagnant answers you really want them in like I know flow state is different but it's like a question flow state right where they are just kind of letting it all come out of their mouths mm -hmm. and then I say to them write it down like let's take this conversation and write it down they're like oh yeah I'll get my pencil and I'm like yeah let's do it right and so being able to do that I think for me the not knowing sets a really great tone for the for the class so it's not just a moment that you're embarrassed by and have a strategy to get around. It's one that you're finding that when you are vulnerable mm -hmm. and you wear on your sleeve that you don't know, but you're really authentically interested in what they're thinking about it because you yeah. love the idea that they're in on thinking at a different level and they're also in on that they're asking better questions. Yeah, like and if I if I'm outside and it's like not snowing like it is right now, and I can get like on the ground with them, like on my tummy and like get right in there with them, then again, it's just like you're just like, yeah, they're into this as much as I'm into this. And it's giving permission to just be like a full on nature nerd in those moments. And so not only that, like for me, I only see the students for so much time and I might never see that kid again, right? So me giving them permission to be like freely to nature nerd like that, hopefully gives them a memory and an experience that will hopefully generate like things moving forward as well, right? And because I don't always get to see them over and over again, um, which is like a blessing and a curse, right? So being able to really give them a permission and then hopefully they'll be able to be like, well, I had this really great experience here. I'm going to try it again and put themselves into that position. And hopefully they have a great teacher that's able to say, yeah, like, let's do that. Right. So I don't know. That's just my right or wrong. I don't know if that's a right answer, but that's what I do. So uh, this, this is, I, 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 I filled a half a page with, with notes on what you're saying. Um, <laughs> but th this is, th this is, this is where we want to get our brains going. So Avea, what was this sparking in you? Well, first of all, can I just say that the the school kid in me gets really, really happy every time Billy Joe says let's, because there's a we in there. There's a, hey, we're going to do this together. This is a partnership. And so it's like, oh, cool. So the teacher and I are on the same team. It's not a teacher's facing me from the front of the class lecturing at me. It's more like we're just going to huddle together. And it, I was one of those kids who really, really liked probably spending more time with the teachers than I did the other kids. So it's like, oh, you mean the teachers and I get to like have fun together? Yeah. So, so yeah, keep, keep doing that. <laughs> um, and then um, let me see here. What was that making me? Oh yeah. Just that. Um, I think I said something like that, um, that not knowing is a great tool. I was agreeing with you, Billy Joe, on that one. And also that it's a lot more honest. Maybe it's because I've been influenced by the psychology of intelligence analysis because we have to mention that book. <laughs> I'm sure my copy is like somewhere around you. No yeah. idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's that as they make the point in that book that our memories can be very faulty. So I think it's more honest to say, oh, I don't know, than to say, I do know. And then your brain makes up the scenario where you know, but yet you don't. My brain likes to do that. And so when I remind myself that I don't know, then it's like, first of all, it's like saying, pause, don't get overly excited and create some story that you that you think is correct, that's not. Um, and then it also gives permission to relearn stuff. Not to mention facts change. Y'all have heard my rant about Lamy, about Lamy Ailey's The Order and how it's a mess and then what asparagus did to Lily. And you all have heard me wow. like rant about how everything's different now. And I'm just like, <sighs> I think but the other you know thing that's fun because yeah, is like I would be like devastated to say something wrong, like because I made it up or I didn't remember correctly, and then have some student go and look it up and be like, 
she's an idiot. She doesn't know anything. She totally told her the wrong thing. I'd rather a kid be like, she had no idea, but we found out together. Like yeah. that to me, like is more credibility than me being wrong, right? Like I know for sure, um, I, my my friend Sarah I work with, she said she took her kids on a, went on a field trip with her, her kids to a field center. And the teacher that was teaching that day was totally calling a monarch butterfly something that wasn't a monarch butterfly caterpillar. And she was just thinking, oh, and she didn't say anything. But again, it's those moments where you're like, if you don't know, just say you don't know, right? As opposed to like having falsehoods and then people go home and start to perpetuate the fact that this isn't what it's supposed to be. So I would rather someone say, yeah, she didn't know, but she was willing to look it up or willing to kind of geek out with me as opposed to she's she's dead set that that's the right answer and I just proved her wrong, right? I just don't have enough ego for that. It's too much to carry around. <laughs> or alternatively, you think that they're tricking you. Like going to the of sciences and not understanding... I apologize. Okay, sorry. Somebody else is going to have to take a turn. I'm being distracted. <laughs> there, may a, there may be a cat on the scene. Um, so, so I am so no fan of Donald Rumsfeld, but I wanted to bring up unknown unknowns um, oh. to, to refresh us on. This is an actually very useful thing he said. Um, yeah, yes, like yes, 80s, yes. That there are things we know that we know, and there are things that are unknown, but we know what those things are but the unknown unknowns are the really you know meaty thing and getting ways to enter into that to leave him aside and come back to us ways to get into what do we not know we don't know um is super exciting as um i think kate was saying about the moss somebody was saying about the moss um like i don't know what those structures are what purpose do they serve, et cetera? Yeah, there's there's a um, a book that would probably be of interest to this community called the Black Swan. The Black Swan, and it's about this idea of the unknown unknowns and the incredible impact that those have. And the um, yeah, when Donald Rumsfeld made that comment, because I at that time did not like the. Thing, a lot of ideas that Donald Rumsfeld had, I, in my head, this was just, you know, he was just talking gobbledygook. And it was years later when I was sort of studying kind of information theory that I found out that he was making this very nuanced, specific, beautiful, important point about cognition. But when I was listening to him, I was just like, you know, you're bad. I don't like you. So that must just be a dumb thing. And he, he actually got blasted by people for that unknown unknown things like you're just like this is just double speak but no he was absolutely making a a beautiful and important point um i wanted to um just uh kind of highlight again what um uh, billy joe was saying about maintaining our inquiry cred right um by saying that we don't know when we don't know and also then wanted to bring Kate back in on this conversation. Uh, you had a, another thought that was relevant to this and also um, uh, Avea, um, are, are, are you? Are, is, I am now distraction is, free, is, so I'll go after Kate. Okay, so but mischief is managed. Mischief managed, okay. So um, then, uh, so we'll bounce, bounce, bounce over to Kate and then up to Avea. And then shortly after that, we will be bringing this conversation to a close. Um, Kate, what is on your mind? Um, one was what Billy Joe had said had sparked something in me because I do, um, I've started doing these presentations and I go to schools and I only see the kids once. And so I've been trying to figure out some sort of electronic way to continue to be in relationship with some of those classrooms. Um, and so if the kids have questions or they, you know, cause the kids said, okay, where did the Kalea go? And I go, I don't know. You guys can figure that out. You know, you guys watch and observe, and then you let me know. And so I'm trying to find some sort of um, easy way to kind of encourage the questioning and the answering and the discovery to continue on. So I'll report back once I, as I experiment um, with that, with certain, you know, web, web things um, for is, you know, especially for classrooms where you're not talking about, you know, Facebook or Instagram, you know, it's how do we, how do we communicate in another way and keep those conversations going? Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say was sparked by what Rosa was talking about is that, you know, the danger that we are facing as a society is that we do have politicians that have to make 
decisions and policymakers who have to make decisions based off of imperfect knowledge. Yeah. And so I just, you know, I attended a three hour long or virtually attended a three hour long meeting on Monday that was talking about water quality. And, um, you know, they have to set an environmental action level for, you know, different chemicals in the water. And they are like, you know, all the people attending are going, well, then how do we know what's safe? How much jet fuel in the water is safe for my baby? You know, and they're saying, you know, no amount of jet fuel is safe. And then how do we know that you filtered it out? And how do we know that you got rid of all the trace chemicals? How you got, how do we know that this is safe or not? And they're saying, like, we don't know. You know, the 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 man that was speaking a lot was his risk assessor, and his job is to assess risk and to look at the published studies and just say, based off of the information that we have. And based off of, you know, people, you know, studies from across the world, you know, looking at all this research, this is our best idea of what this level is. And it was fascinating hearing him talk and how uncomfortable, understandably, because you're talking about your health and your life and your body. And, um, and what was uncomfortable, though, for me as, as somebody too, I mean, obviously, like it's a very volatile, difficult conversation to be having. Um, but on top of it, there was this layer of certainty, right? Because they were making a policy. So they had to just kind of put this line in the sand and say, at this point, this is as much we're going to do, or this is as much as needs to happen. And so um, what was difficult was this, you know, there was a little bit of this energy of dismissal of just kind of, you know, oh, um, you know, well, at 266 parts per, you know, billion and, you know, it's like a drop in a swimming pool, you know, we've, we're, we're confident that that's okay and that's safe. And families are going, but do we know that? How much was in the water? Do we really know how much was in the water? We were having these effects. What is the result when it's combined with the other chemicals and the additives that are in the water? and you know, and it's this this conflict that happens in the public sphere when you have to make policy, you know, people have to make decisions and those decisions, people's lives are riding on the decisions. I and mean, we saw that during the pandemic too, you know, where, you know, you just have to say at some point, either <laughs> this is safe <laughs> and then you individually have to make that decision for yourself as well. And so, you know, I've kind of changed my advocacy is how can we get more information to people, you know, more readily and have more transparency to the public? Because there's this hesitancy to do that because you're like, oh, I don't want people to freak out and make their, you know, rash decisions. Um, so we're going to make that decision for you. And then people are going, well, we don't agree with that decision, you know? And so how do we have, you know, um, the information presented in a way that's a little bit more understandable and digestible and people can kind of make decisions, you know, if I'm a 60 year old man and I'm drinking this water and I weigh 200 pounds, how worried really am I? I think I'm going to be fine. You know, I'm not going to get cancer in 50 years. If I have a newborn baby, I'm going to make their formula with bottle, bottled water, you know, like, you know, that, that they're allowing for a degree of nuance that people can, you know, incorporate their own decision and, and, and being people trying to learn how to be okay with, with we don't really know and we're doing the best we can and we're trying to figure it out. Um, it's just, it's hard. And it's really hard trying to communicate with people as somebody who, you know, I'm in the military sphere. I'm, you know, a, you know, local politician kind of figure. And then also like, you know, deeply caring about these families or, you know, they're my friends. <laughs> like, how do you share all this sort of conflict and this internal conflict of, you know, we don't know, but we have to make decisions and we have to make choices about our lives going forward and where you live and what you drink and what you bathe in and, and all these sort of things um, based off of imperfect evidence and information. And so, you know, I think that's where a lot of that, you know, energy again, and that uh, distress can come up when we're talking about the unknown unknowns. Or even in that case, you're actually talking about known unknowns. Yes. Um, and the unknown unknowns are the ones that nobody at that table is talking about. Yes. The, um, so uh, it, as, as you were speaking, you, you saw uh, Avea and I playing kind of pop-up with this book. Um, so this has been our, our, our book club book. 
uh, psychology of intelligence analysis. It's a declassified CIA document um, about how do you make decisions in conditions where you don't have all the information and you're making it as a human being with all of our kind of biases and and um, and there are consequences to these decisions um, for 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 people um, or for policies and at some point you have to make a, a decision and then and they're actually talking about exactly these sorts of things that you're you're discussing how when you make a decision how do you then not just say oh it's 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 done discussion is off the table well what sort of things do you then look for in case you're wrong what are the things that you then need to be monitoring for that will be red flags that you should change your decision and change your policy um, if you were wrong about one of your key assumptions or a bit of evidence that that you uh, took into account it's a very very useful book but you're you're absolutely right and in sciences we it's not about, you know, the, anybody who's saying, like, how do you know the answer to that to any question in science is we, we don't, right? Um, but this is, given the evidence that we have at the time, this is the best explanation that we have, and this is our best guess given the evidence that we have. And you know, knowing is more of a philosophical thing, like truth. Like science is not about truth. It's about getting the best explanation for the phenomenon that you have in front of you, given the evidence that you have. And you change the evidence or the strength of that evidence, and you're going to, you're willing to change your mind. So in science, we have this critical idea of provisional acceptance of an explanation and that that is always subject to change and um so this 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 book here had had a sort of i think was at the end of chapter eight was it was it chapter eight with where they kind of gave their big system of AI? yeah so at the end of chapter eight in this go check this out it, the whole book is available for free online because it's a government document you can get this book all for free online and then check check out the end of of, of, of chapter eight and they're talking about how when you kind of come to these conclusions and you suggest policy or a decision on that what sort of things do you still need to be monitoring because once you put your your stake down we can tend to get our ego wrapped around it i said this so i'm going to stick by it but you actually they're suggesting to look for what kind of red flags would make you change your mind in case you're you're, you're wrong. Um, Avea, love to hear what the, the rest of your, um, the thought that you were um, started on before you were, um, before some mischief interrupted you. And then also any thoughts or ideas um, that you have to kind of take us out. Um, I think in just a moment, we'll be kind of wrapping up this discussion. Um, but uh, Avea, what's on your mind? Also wanted to add really fast about, about the book. Not only do we get ourselves wrapped around it, but then also if we're being asked by external forces, especially external forces that have a dog in the fight to make that um, to make that hard and fast call, like what Kate was saying about analysts being pressured to have all of that information, like or rather to make a call with incomplete information, then then it makes it harder to change your mind later because first of all, you're being told to keep, you know, this exact um thought and you're kind of being pressured to not change your mind but you need to change your mind because maybe the strength of your evidence isn't strong enough to support your original conclusion so it's important to remain really flexible with that so anyways it's a really fun book highly recommend i put the link into the chat uh, for for jack's tuesday nights and you can find the link to the books download on that um on any of those so just so folks know that is there um let's see here um, earlier, we were talking about not knowing about how that is, um, how that's an awesome tool. It's also more honest um, because then when you, like what Billy Joe was saying, when you say outright that you don't know, then you can either figure it out together or like earlier, I tried to think of my best guess for what, um, for what a tuber was because it says mad botanist on my name. But the thing is that I realized 
no, no, it's, it's funny. <laughs> That's why I put it there. Um, but then I was like, and I noticed about myself that I'd felt the pressure to know what I was talking about because mad botanist. But then I was like, but truthfully, I'm not entirely sure, am I? I better admit that and then look it up. And each time you do that, then it becomes a little bit easier to look something up and then to double check your knowledge. And, and admitting that you don't know a thing is a sign, in my opinion, of, of strength. Um, plus then, um, this probably sounds silly, but you also get the, the joy of learning it all over again. <laughs> learning new things is so much fun. And so, and so yeah, um, I, I might feel self-conscious. It's like, I'm a botanist. I'm supposed to know this. I'm like, no, no, no. Remember my own definition of botanist. It's not about knowing a ton of stuff. There's more that I don't know than what I actually know. It's about my enthusiasm for learning the stuff. That's why I'm a botanist is because I love plants. Um, and um, the other thing too is that Again, I'm really, really biased, although I'm not sure which kind of bias this qualifies as. I have to go look at the chart. Um, but I am, I find that curiosity on a page just gives it that extra sparkle. Like pages can be beautiful in all of their different forms. And I'm really biased, but I like the paprika of question marks all over journal pages. It's like that extra little zing. And I look at it and I'm just like, Wait, oh. hold on. I have to interrupt. Did you just say the paprika of question marks all over the page? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I, I have to, that's that's a, a Vea quote <laughs> that I have to write down. The paprika of I like the paprika of question marks all over the page. That that is a quotable. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, it just gives it that extra sparkle. There's something really pretty about having question marks all over a page. So hopefully that's a motivator to get people to, to not know things all of the time is because then you get to write down more questions. And um, I'm not sure what else I had to say. <laughs> Here's a point where I'd probably try to end with a really good pun, but I don't have any. Um, well, the... Um... Uh, you, you just made a quote that went on the back of my, my, my journal here. You actually have another quote on the front of it. Um, but uh, so uh, that you, you don't have to end with a, a quote because you gave us the whole paprika line. And that's money. Well, thank you. In that case, go sprinkle some paprika on your potatoes. Darn it. <laughs> they, 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 they deserve it in their own little crazy ways. Yeah. Is is paprika an actual kind of like chili pepper? Um, I think we so, need to find out. I think we need to find out. Because if so, that's solanaceae on solanaceae. So maybe <sighs> potatoes are solanaceous. They're nightshades, and so are peppers. <laughs> and where where does paprika come from? We will oh, find out by the next bit. So that's actually uh, a little thing to put in your, your nature journal. Put a little box with a to-do check mark. Where does paprika come from? Next time you'll know. Um, we're folks, ending on a question. <laughs> it has been a wonderful um, session with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, um, for your thoughts, your, your insights. Um, I hope that today's little workshop is going to make it easier for people just to find a cool phenomena and then have the confidence to go online with it and get curious publicly. Um, I hope that our discussion here is going to help people be able to embrace that idea of not knowing as a strength. And that when you do that, when you, um, when you kind of lean into what you don't know, um, your students are going to ask better questions. And I think that's also a real powerful take home. Um, hey, thank you all for being here. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all again. Um, special thanks to my co-hosts, Billy Joe Reed and Avea Moore. Um, thank you to um, Kate, Rosa, and all the crew for your uh, thoughts, ideas, and inspiration. And we look forward to playing with you again. Take care and be kind.